what kind of application areas they can be used and also why do we need unicorn nodes? Okay, so to start with, let's actually start with the definition of what unikernel is. So there's a website unikernel.org, you can have a lot of information about unikernels. <clears throat> but essentially what unikernels are, are unikernels are single image operating system. So typically you have a virtual machine, you know, you have layers and layers on top of it, you have a application stack, maybe dockers and so on. What unikernel essentially is, is that it fuses everything into one image so so there's no distinction between an application a virtual machine or anything in between and i'll have some uh, i have some diagrams to actually include what these layers are and how they're included yeah Oops, sorry okay so let's actually look at the picture today right you have an application it runs an operating system right operating system says usually a lot of lines of code I don't know, I think Windows is not there, but Windows is actually quite big, Linux, OS, and then you have whole sorts of utilities. So this picture somewhat resembles an iceberg, right? What you care about or what you see is just the tip. There's a really big bulky stuff that is beneath that you actually don't care about. And as a result, you have a lot of stuff present in your production system that is running that was not part of your application. And often you don't actually need, or not all of it, right? You might need some of it. And the problem here is that software is inherently a very complex thing, right? In software, you have different, different moving parts, right? You have several processes, threads running. And different moving parts, what it does is it increases the possibility of failures because there is many millions of combinations of things that could potentially go wrong. You also have like millions and millions of lines of code. So millions and millions of lines of code means your application would take time to boot up, to run. And lots of code also means that there are lots of vulnerabilities, right? So every now and then you hear stories about XYZ hack this website, you know, all sorts of buffer overflow attacks and so on. And the problem is all these attacks that are happening, very many of them are happening at the part of the code that you actually don't use and you just have it for the sake of having it and your application suffers because of it it doesn't really get any benefit about it. so all this complexity is kind of unnecessary right and the reason why we have these complexity is because an operating system or a docker even probably less true for docker but still the same thing they are general purpose systems right they don't have any particular use case in mind and they don't have any particular user and so on and they don't even have any estimates on the size that you use so they are trying to create this one solution that works for everybody and what happens is it kind of works for everybody but it doesn't work perfectly for anybody because it's like a jack of all trade master of none kind of situation right so you have all this complexity and with an operating system, you have a lot of different configuration points, right? You have to configure this, you have to configure that, you, which often you don't use. And if you look at the trends that are happening, you know, people are moving towards microservices and people are moving more towards, in, in, a, in an abstract way, what we are is we are moving from a monolithic to a world of microservices where you have more granularity and assembly of smaller systems working together than having one big large ball of mud as I like to call it. And these microservices, they follow the single responsibility principle, which is rather than, you know, having a jack of all trade system, focus on one thing and do that one thing really, really well. So the current scenario that we have is kind of an anti-pattern in the modern world. Most apps are single purpose. Most microservices want to have one or two endpoints. Yet we have to inherit this huge, huge, big bulk of code that we don't use. So the question is, is there a way to reduce the complexity? Can we do that? Turns out there are ways of doing it. We'll cover that. Another problem that we have is lack of portability. That portability probably is not big of a problem when you're running on some sort of managed environment. For example, Java virtual machine. It's it's not a big problem. It is a problem to some extent. 
but if you're using like a low level node native app, like something like a C++ app, you're using operating system libraries. And as much as you have standards, not everybody follows the standard 100%. So you, you end up in a situation where your code is semi-portable, right, across, across different platforms, across different devices. And this is often not, not a good scenario because in the modern world, what we have is we have a set of a lot of these devices that work together rather than having like one common pattern. So, so it becomes difficult to reuse the code and that, that's one of the things that we need to worry about. Can we enhance the portability? So for us to have this problem solved, what we need to do is we need to have a solution that somehow, you know, focuses on the problem at hand and distangles you from the underlying system, operating system or whatever platform you're using, right? You, you want to focus on your code and not worry as much as possible about the rest of it. You also want to do something like if I don't need 50 services, I shouldn't have them, right? My application is a single process application in a microservice, right? I need e easy scalability, but let's say I don't want too much threading. I don't want a file system. I'm not storing anything. It's a, it's a stateless application. I have a DB connected, right? But I still have a file system. So if you have a solution that, that only takes all the components of the operating system that you actually need, you solve a lot of security problems, a lot of portability problems that you otherwise inherit. And finally, you would need something like from a single platform, I should inherit multiple platforms, right? So can we have such a practical solution? Well, we kind of have it. And that solution is called as containers, right? So what is a container? A container is essentially a stripped down VM. So you don't have inherit the entire VM. You have like a subset of bare essentials. You build layers and layers of your application. And essentially, you have a Docker and any platform where containers are supported. You can package your application. You can run it on your local system. Hey, it works. Then I can take this container as a whole and deploy it on my production environment. It works. You have different tools like Kubernetes, Mesosphere, you know, all you're running containers at scale. Things fail at scale. So you need a way to handle resiliency. All those things. Good. And you can deploy it to multiple platforms. So far, so good. Except the problem is, this is not a perfect solution. It's better than what we have in the VM world, but not a perfect solution. Why? Because containers don't really eliminate the libraries that you don't use. They just reduce the amount of it, right? So container is basically a mini VM. That's what it is. All the services of VM, you still have those services in a container. Not that you don't have it. You may not have as much of them, you have less code, sure, but containers are inherently, there are issues with containers, especially on the network. If you have one VM, you're running a lot of containers, you're likely to have problems. So containers are a solution. It's a step in the right direction, but it's not, it's not the perfect or it's not the ideal solution that we are looking for. Obviously, there is no such thing as an ideal in the world, but we, what we want to do is we still want to go as close as possible where we reduce the amount of inherited code that you can and focus more on the application. And that solution comes with unikernels. So what is a unikernel, right? Essentially, what you have is your whole operating system has certain set of components. A unikernel, what it does is it takes your application code and it takes all the components of the operating system that you actually need and ignore the rest that you don't need, which is going to be 90% of the case, and package them together. Sorry about that. I don't know why is this happening. Okay, good. Something happening with the connection. Uh, okay, I'll just keep talking until, yeah. So what a unikernel actually does is takes this library components and fuses them together as an application, right? So when you're building your application at build time, it takes those components. We'll see some example and it only uses the libraries that you actually require. And a unikernel really is a single process system, right? You don't have a lot of processes, let alone threads and so on. And what it does is let's say that now I want to port my application in some other platform, right? I still have the uniform interface where I'm calling the OS libraries. So my application is ported, let's say, on JVM. Now I swap it out and I want to put it on a hypervisor running on a Zen virtualization server. 
So a unikernel will target multiple runtimes. So I would build that application for the second platform that I have. It takes the same components that run, it takes the equivalent components, right, that have the same interface and it packages it. It runs on another platform. So think of it something like, let's say you have something like a Docker, but is not one such Docker, but there's a Docker for different kind of environments. So you can package it in a similar way and generates a different container for each one of the target platforms that you can deploy. But you don't really have to change your application for it. Your application, the interface for those components are still the same. So if your application remains unchanged, you just have to recompile your application for your different platform and you're done. So this is this is traditional a traditional application stack, right? You, you have a kernel space and then you have a user space and your operating system, process management network, all those things, they use the kernel space and then your application library routines using the user space. One of the performance problems that you have with this is that you have to switch between kernel space and user space rapidly when you're running. What Unikernel does, it, it fuses them together. So what you have is there. And by the way, this networking and that networking is not exactly the same. For, ex uh, for example, you may not use all components of networking, so that component would only have the stuff that your application actually needs. And notice that there is no process management because you don't have processes in your kernel. And let's say if you don't use file system, you won't have file system in your application. So it's like on-demand basis. So this is how unikernel application stack uh, would actually <coughs> look like. Okay, so let's actually look at the evolution of or evolution in the, I'm so sorry. Okay, I think the connection is weak. Can somebody have a look at it? What's happening here? Yeah, it's just going blank. Okay, now it's working here, yeah, but I think there's a loose connection there. Okay, sorry, sorry for the interruption. So I was at evolution. See, it again goes back. It's, I think, the. If it can stand, stand here and if something goes bad, you can fix it. So just thank you. That's, uh, yeah. My apologies for this, but anyway, let's actually look at evolution, right? So you have the hypervisor, and then you have big, large components of OS, and then your application. And when you look at how how the space is moving, what you see is that the app component increases more and more, and the OS component shrinks. So what you have in unikernel is nothing but the next step of evolution beyond containers. That's what unikernels are. But there's a general trend that we should focus more on the stuff that we actually need and less on stuff that is just an overhead that we may not even use. So what are the characteristics of uh, unikernel, right? What makes unikernel so unique? So I already kind of discussed that. Unikernels are often um, high performance. And the reason why there's high performance is because there is less code, right? There's less overhead. And there is fast switch, there's no switching between user kernel mode. So they actually operate very fast. They, um, they're obviously a lot smaller because you don't really have a uh, large overhead of OS code. In fact, there have been cases where unikernels basically just going KBs. You tell somebody, you know, KBs, they'll be like, are you kidding me? But typically for microservices, right, you're only handling one or two endpoints. You don't really need a lot of code for that. So unikernels tend to be very, uh, very small. And what another characteristic is faster boot times. Because you have less code and your code component, uh, your hypervisor component, your, sorry, your operating system, very thin, you don't really need a lot of, a uh, lot of time to boot. And this actually has a very interesting property. And I'll cover that in details in the later slide. But you could have something like an on demand provision. Sorry.
सिक्योरिटी ऑप्शन मूव टू स्लाइड बैक या दैट एक्चुअली इज अ इज अ प्रॉब्लम जनरली बिकॉज एवरीथिंग हैज अ रूट प्रिवलेज यू डोंट रियली हैव अ कंसेप्ट ऑफ सिक्योरिटी well i mean you are trusting people who are writing the code to write code you have methods to test code and all those things right uh, you have producing logs and so on so you have a mechanism to audit and you have to trust your development system i mean there is no built in security you could potentially add a layer nothing stops you from doing that but there is no inherent uh, security mechanism and it's a little bit of a a little bit of a design philosophy also because the very fundamental principle of a unique kernel is have what you only need don't have what you don't need so if you need security you could add a layer yourself but unique kernel will not enforce a security for you because it wants to give you the freedom of not having it right that's that's a kind of a trade off i mean it's the same thing as and this is another thing that i've covered later on is like if you have lot of utilities of your os that you actually need then unikernel is not the best way because you don't have that equivalent in a unikernel right the very the very premise of unikernel is be lean just have what you need and put things as you go along uh, did that answer your question yeah sure okay so i was talking about the application of faster boot time um when you have microservices you want to scale up you actually can scale up on demand if you have load you know you have an auto balance that scales up because provisioning a unique kernel and booting it so fast you literally can do it on demand there's actually a slide there's a project about it jitsu i'll have the details in that slide which is what it does it just every time you get a request it provisions a new unique kernel as your load expands just on demand and, and it works because it's just few milliseconds you won't even notice it okay so in the embedded system world what you have is you know when i was a kid i used to play with not so much of a kid but in graduate school uh, i used to play with those microprocessor kits right you have the 8088 assembly language and you have a development environment on a dos pc you write that code you have an emulator that tests it everything and finally when you deploy it in production environment which is a microprocessor kit in this case like an embedded environment right it produces that binary that you load it on your microprocessor and that's a single image binary so in a way unique kernel applies the same philosophy to the cloud uh, that when you develop it you have emulators you have testing stack and everything and you test everything is okay and when you talk about deploying it just uses everything is one binary image and just deploys it on your hypervisor and the problem with that approach which is even an approach with an embedded system is you have no visibility of what is happening in your actual production environment so during your development testing you have all the tracing everything you're using emulator so when you actually put it on your device that's the end so that's kind of a drawback and how you actually usually they do it in embedded systems and you have to use the same approach is during the development you could have logging right so you take that issue um and you replicate that issue in your debug environment and figure out what's happening some people consider it as a drawback to unikernel i personally don't think it as a drawback because i've never come across someone who does live debugging in production what you are really doing is you're replicating that in a debug environment nothing stops you from replicating that in the debug environment anyway right so for someone and i don't know of anyone like that who does live debugging in production that would be an issue but not for most of us um use case scenario okay so microservices is like really popular these days every talk on software architecture talks about microservices and unikernels are quite a good platform quite a good way to approach uh, to implement microservices because they are you know small independent single uh responsibility principle and they have low boot times i already covered that right that means rapid scaling because you need that elasticity when you operate at scale another potential application is immutable infrastructure so you reduce your dependency on external components how just take everything and prepare it as one image so statically link the data 
So these are different use case scenarios. These are just typical use case scenarios, right? There's, there's obviously a very many of them. So let's actually move on to the development <coughs> of it. So how um, this is how a development stack would look like. Okay. So during a development, you have your standard operating system and you have a development runtime, right? Typically, how it works in embedded, right? You have an emulator. Think of it as an emulator. So your application compiles. You don't actually need the kernel routines because your standard operating system is providing you that during the development phase. Then, once I have the development done, I move to the testing. So testing would have all that. Testing still will take all those kernels and file system because you want to know how your application will behave in the production environments. So you take into effect, but you're still running under the standard operating system. And finally, once your testing is done, you actually move to the production. So production takes everything and then puts it on the hypervisor. And this is where you lose all the all the visibility of your system. Um, another thing I should actually caution about in kernel is that because there is no difference between an operating system and, op uh, and an application, let's say you allocate 4 GB of RAM to an image, right? On your system, it will show that you have 4 GB. Finish. You're consuming all 4 GB, even if you don't actually use it. Whereas I think in Docker's, you actually have the ability to take some GB from one container and put it in another. You would not have that operator. Uh, you would not have that um, facility in unikernels because the fundamental fact is a unikernel does not differentiate between what is an operating system and what is an application. They're both the same. And what tends to often happen is that you don't want your system to crash during production from running out of memory. So as a result, you know, you tend to overestimate the amount of, because you want to play it safe, you tend to overestimate the amount of memory that you actually need and provision it accordingly. All right. So let's actually go to the benefits of using uh, Unikernel. Well, first and foremost, you have you know smaller image. So you have smaller image means you have a either you can use a cheaper VM or you can have high multi tenancy, right? So you can have several applications packed in one VM. You have reduced memory fin and you have reduced computational burden. So you don't actually need that much of computation power to power a unikernel application as much as you would need in a you know a traditional let's say vm docker based application um, another advantage boot times you know you're talking about milliseconds so reduced sorry okay sorry text is wrong faster boot times right you have really fast boot times because you're talking about milliseconds, you have less amount of code. Better security. You have less amount of code means you are giving basically an attacker less attack surface. Because an attacker would exploit known vulnerabilities of OS and chances are you actually don't use those components in the first place. So attacker can do anything. You also don't have a command line shell. So you can't have like a root privilege and you know root run root commands. You just don't have it. So reduced attack surface essentially gives you a lot better security properties in the kernel. Um, okay, why not use the kernel? So far, so good. We are talking about all the benefits. Obviously, this is not a perfect solution, and uh, there are drawbacks. To start with, you you are working on the premise that I don't use a lot of components. Of operating, I don't, I don't need all the components of operating system. But what if you need them, right? So this is unikernel is like an on-demand, right? I don't need file system, I don't have file system. But what if you need it? There are times where you need a lot of utilities, and obviously those are the times you don't want unikernel because they, they would not have all those. You have to implement it yourself. It's too much of a burden. So there's a lot of software for Linux that is not present in. Um, unikernels and one of the drawbacks generally with unikernel is that it's relatively a new technology, right? And with any new technology, there is a there's a lack of tooling, there is a lack of knowledge. There's, there's just not good enough ecosystem. Hopefully, hopefully this is something that we would fix as time passes by. But that's the state of affairs right now. Um, 
it, unicorns are still gaining popularity i think with 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 the switch to microservices i would say that adoption of uh, unicornal is going to be much more than um, as opposed to now but it's still you know it's, it's a while before we see unicornals entering a mainstream technology okay so we have a lot of implementation i just have some of them right but if you go to this website you have a lot of them um, one of the things with unikernels is because the operating system and application is fused together you have a limit on a certain kind of programming languages because you don't really have a general purpose system that a vm has so for example mirage os you will have to have your application in a language called ocaml for those of you who are not familiar it's a functional programming language from the ml ml family that was in 1975 they had this language called ml used for natural language processing theorem proving and so on so mirage os is there you have click os you know it boots on the 30 millisecond very tiny you have um haskell's vm hl and this is actually made by a famous company called uh, gal it's actually a french company they write it as galois the grounds is at galois uh, this requires you to have haskell um you also have some kind of uh, unique kernels that basically emulate something like a tomcat server right so any application that is running on tomcat server you could potentially uh, have it in unikernels and you know put it on this uh, i forgot the name i think it's osv osv is an uh, osv is there. yeah this one this actually i think emulates the tomcat server okay so one of the popular virtualization server um, for unikernels is zen virtualization server and what zen virtualization server is, is it's a microkernel design right so it doesn't have that monolithic it uses para virtualization what is para virtualization let's say that you're you're in your network right your data comes in your data is unpacked and then your application because the application does not know whether let's say you're running on a host vm right and you have several vms running on a hypervisor your application does not actually know whether you're running on a hypervisor or on a native vm right it's transparent to that so you have a data coming from the network you actually unpack the data and then you have to repack the data and then send it to the application which will unpack it again so para virtualization is sort of uh, essentially a modified image where it makes a certain assumption and it's aware of the fact that i'm actually running in a hypervisor or in a virtual environment and not in native so it ha it expects a uniform interface and in that interface it actually can do a lot it, it it doesn't have to do a lot of unnecessary work that a traditional vm on a hypervisor would have to do so what it gives you is the benefit of having high performance zen is a very high performance hypervisor and it also has a live migration what is a live migration the term live migration actually is a little bit misleading it, the right term i think would be semi live migration but what live migration is that you can move your image while it's being run from one physical host to another physical host with almost no interruption and i'm using the word almost because there is tiny tiny interruption that's why i'm calling the semi live migration but you could do that whereas you can't do something on like that on a docker right you have to stop redeploy on a physical host and that's important let's say in an application areas where you have to move an application is running from one data center to another data center because maybe maybe your users come from another part of the world so let's say i have an application running in a us data center and suddenly i have a surge of application coming a surge of requests coming from china and i think it's actually better lower latency for me to move this application from my us data center to chinese data center you can do that without interruption that's what zen allows you to do a lot of uh, unikernel projects actually target the zen uh, zen virtualization server including mirage os and talking about mirage os let's actually introduce mirage os so mirage os mirage tool basically builds these unikernels for various backends now what you see here i don't know if it's visible i think it is yeah so you have different backends x86 hardware the browser and you know google java which can run on google app engine and what it does is it 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 has these components for all of these backends so it takes your application and you have to write your application in ocaml to be used for mirage os 
and combined with them, you can retarget all the different kind of uh, platforms that Mirage OS supports. Uh, I think the Mirage OS 3 um, has some additional, this is, this is up till version 3. Version 3 supports some additional uh, platforms that I have not included here. Okay. So we talked about on demand application. Well, there's a project called Jitsu. That's the source. And what it does is, it's just in time summoning of unikernel. So as I have a request, I can just boot up a unikernel, process that request. And, you know, there are all sorts of different configuration. I can keep it alive. But if I see that the request load is doing and I don't really need that many instances of the kernel, I can shut them down. You could do the same thing in a traditional environment. The problem is that it takes more time. It takes few seconds for you to boot up and shut down. Whereas in Unikernel, because that boot up and shutdown process is really, really fast, you can do it quite nicely. Like you can do it at a rapid pace of scaling, downscaling and upscaling. So DNS server would start the Unikernels on demand. It's, it's actually been tested on Mirage OS. Mirage OS folks, they actually have this Jitsu project and rumped up unikernels. Anyway, so I have some resources. Um, for Mirage OS, you have this. For unikernels, I already showed this website. Actually, wiki page is, is quite, it describes unikernel quite well. Um, there are some research papers, there are some articles, and we do have a book from O'Reilly about unikernels. So, um, that's a good reference. Uh, coming towards the end, the conclusion. So, Unikernel is a promising new technology. It's, it's actually the next step of evolution. But again, right now it's kind of immature. I would see the adoption growing more as we move more towards the microservices world. But relatively now it's, it's, it's in its infancy. It's particularly relevant for cloud and microservices era, as I mentioned. Um, their secure images support very high multi-tenancy, very fast boot times, on-demand provisioning. You have a lot of open source projects. Uh, there are some commercial projects also, but they support a large number of different platforms and runtimes. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's still in its infancy and, you know, there's an ecosystem around it is relatively immature. Um, I'm up for questions. I think microservices would have a lot of use cases. I do not know of right now, I'm not aware of any big case study or any um, particular commercial application that I can point out because it's, I mean, like I said, it's relatively new. Uh, there's open stuff running, but I would say that microservices would be one potential application area that I could completely see. And the, what makes unique kernels really good for microservices, there are two particular things that stand out. One, or actually three, I would say. One, they are small images, which means high level of multi-tenancy. So that's more cost-effectiveness for you, right? In one VM, you can run many instances. B, security, less attack surface. And three, fast scaling. Because you have low boost time, you can create more instances very fast. So microservice is actually something like a really good application area for uni services. Microservices obviously have gained a lot of traction. Uh, more, many organizations have adopted it. Some are still in process. I had a friend in Microsoft. Uh, he actually called me last week. Microsoft has now started adopting microservice. Yeah. So those would be the particularly uh, niche areas for Unicorn. Like any application, I'd say that it, it picks up when you have a certain niche areas where the, you know, there is a dying need for it. And, and I see the potential. How far would Unicorn go? Nobody knows that. Um, any other question? I think what would happen is that uh, the way I see it is that uh, most of the applications right now leave the entire uh, spectrum of OS is because they are doing some someone is doing network, someone is doing some part yeah. of the application is doing file and some part of the application might also be doing image processing. So that's why you need the whole stuff. 
Yeah. But let's say if I have to uh, emulate this is in a non, um, unikernel environment, I will still have different unikernels using different portions of uh, the OS and the vulnerability part which you talked about might still be present in one of one of the other uh, unikernels which is currently deployed in my hmm. entire system. Yeah. So I agree with you. Monolithic is obviously an anti-pattern for unikernel. I think in terms of adoption, and this is this is not related to unikernel. See, the graph is not a linear graph that you go over time, right? You have some early adopters, and they experimented, and you know everybody says things, and then you have a little bit of disappointment because people start thinking, "Hey, this is the perfect technology." Unfortunately, there's no such thing as a perfect technology. And finally, you find like one or two niche areas where. You know, suddenly it becomes popular. Hey, this is the kind of problem solved, and then everybody starts doing it. So the graph would look, you know, initially the growth is slow, and then there is an inflection point, and then it picks up. Uh, unique kernels have obviously not reached that inflection point, and hopefully they do. But obviously, there is no such thing as a guarantee in that aspect. So yes, we are in the infancy, and also for for a lot of eye adoption, you need a mature tooling. Tooling is often very important. I mean, I've had people using antique system just because everybody uses java sorry in my personal opinion they suck but hey as an excellent ecosystem there's no doubt about it right so the ecosystem actually matters and it becomes a cash 22 situation right people want to adopt because there's a good ecosystem but there'll be a good ecosystem because there has to be good yeah so once that cycle hits a mature point you would see the growth we are not there yet in terms of unique kernels. Um, any other questions? During the build time. During the build time, you can actually, because you import the library. See, think of think of your traditional operating system, right? You're importing certain headers. So imagine that let's let me talk a very simple C stuff. You're you're importing STDIO or some sort of header, right? Now if you have a smart compiler, that says, okay, you imported STIO, but I know from your code that you actually use the 10 functions out of the 50 functions, right? I would create an STDIO for you that only has those 10 functions. And obviously, if those 10 functions call something else, then I would have those dependent functions. But I would not have everything, right? So a Mirage compiler or any Unicorn compiler is smart enough that it knows when you declare that these are the dependencies you actually need. So it, it has this entire operating system, its library components, and then just pulls those components as and when needed rather than just pulling everything. The comp and that happens during the compile time. So when your image is built, it only has these necessary components. Um, any other questions? Okay, thank you.